happy new year. Hello. Hello. Happy new year. Happy new year. It is 2022. How many times have you said that in practice? 2022, 2022, 2022. Who would have imagined we would be here? Like, well, for me, 2022, I'm in Belize and I am so happy. I've been so ecstatic. I've been tickled just by the thought of being here back home. This is uh, where my family's from. I like to say I was made here, but I was born in the United States. So therefore LA super agent. Say hi, say hello, drop a comment down below. Let me know you're here. You know what to do. Press one lets me know you're here. Press two lets me know you shared it. We're gonna have a fun show today. I'm a little bit more stable with the exception of uh, Wi-Fi or internet connectivity. If I get disconnected, oh, well, you'll see You'll see me next week. Um, let me see, who else do I want to connect? I just want to get caught up. So in these last couple of days, I've been traveling. I've been traveling within the country and the mainland. And now Kyle and I are in the Keys. We are enjoying our stay here in San Pedro, also known as Ambergis Keys. And it's extraordinary. It's just a beautiful. I'm going to share a video clip shortly. But before I do that, I want to do some announcements. So shout out to those of you who are tuning in on our radio podcast everywhere, listening to Ready, Set, Real Estate. So if you did not know, yes, we are available on radio podcast. That's on iTunes, Apple Pot, Spotify. I've got to shout out Spotify because Spotify is now doing something unique. They are now doing video, radio. See, this whole concept, and Kyle and I have been talking about this, this concept of TV revamped, right? Because now I'm streaming TV live on LinkedIn, live on Facebook, live on YouTube, YouTube on YouTube, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and then we replay on Instagram. So if you are following me there, hello, make sure you say hi, say hello, drop a comment down below. What else? So uh, announcements with radio podcasts. And I just love that we are now streaming everywhere. Oh, and shout out to the ERGJ platform. ERGJ also has a channel streaming with many shows. So we get to stream alongside ERGJ uh, with Ready Set Real Estate in collaboration with the Black Billionaires Club. So the BBC group is continuing strong, well, and alive. So shout out to my brother, Evan Jefferson, still doing amazing things. And I appreciate his continued support. What else? This year, oh, so I was just having this moment and I was thinking, okay, we've got to get some classes going because there's so much things happening. So on the 19th, we're going to launch or kick off our first real estate classes. So tune in, you know, I do free game. I, I give away free real estate game. Oh, speaking of that, I'm just like assuming all of you know who I am because <laughs> I've been doing this 500 plus episodes in, but hello and welcome if you're streaming and connecting with me for the first time. I'm a little bit informal today because, you know, girlfriend is at the Keys, okay? So this is where I get to wear a, a bikini, teenkini, teenkini tank tops and just kind of look fresh and look all dolled up, a little bit more relaxed. My name's Lisa Gillette. I'm also a real estate broker. I'm an active licensed California real estate broker. And currently I'm on work, workation. Is that the term? Workation? It's not vacation. It's not a vacation for me because I'm with husband and husband's not my bae. He's more than that. This is, this is, you know, so, and it's, it's just a whole nother level too, when you travel with someone you love and, and you're in partnership with and you're in friendship that's a whole nother show topic that I should probably do. That'll be like to shift your thinking for those of you who remember me doing shift your thinking. I shifted my thinking so much so that I manifested a successful business. I magnetized my dream partner, my husband. For some of you who aren't aware, I'm recently married. I just celebrated my first anniversary in November. So does this count as a honeymoon, honey? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it feels like a honeymoon every day. And I'm not going to go into that because some of you are not ready for all this 
this uh, this grateful, just next level Lisa, where every single thing that I have been envisioning and working on has come to fruition. So again, like I said, that's some true shifter thinking stuff that I have been working on for many, many, many years. So I love the saying where people see like this overnight success, overnight things happening and saying, oh my gosh, I see you doing all these things, but no one sees you put in the work. Lisa's put in the work for many, many years. This is like year 15, 16 for me in the real estate business. And my accolades, I would say, comes from just my life's purpose. I wrote a real estate book, real estate literacy, founded a real estate literacy curriculum for children ages 10 and up. Yeah, that was me. And so if you keyword real estate 100, the teen home buying experience, uh, the teen and millennial investment blueprint, we are also re uh, releasing the teen and millennial real estate land developer series, it's like a whole series we're launching. So I'm really excited to do that. And I still actively do that in collaboration with organizations, either they're for-profit or nonprofit. And we still do teach our youth and young adults real estate literacy. And I have so much fun doing that. And I just, I just love it. I love that aspect of it. So do know, stay connected that uh, we are airing the show back again, Wednesday specific time where I am. It's after a little, a little bit after one o'clock. And I'll be back in my regular time zone, although I kind of prefer being in this time zone. This is what part of Kyle and I are doing, traveling, just kind of see where bicoastal living is going to happen since we have Wi-Fi. I like that's what I call Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, the internet. You can do work from home anywhere and everywhere. It'd be so cool. That'd just be so cool. I can fly in for my client's loan signing and deliver keys. Isn't that going to be awesome? I love it. If I look this way, it's because I'm looking towards my husband. He's like sitting over here. <laughs> He's sitting close. He's sitting close. All right. So we are continuing. What else is happening? Announcements, announcements. Uh, so New Year's happened. So wishing you a wonderful, happy new year to you and yours. Trust that you are all safe. You are all well. You are in good health. And what else? I drink lots of water. I've been drinking tons of water. I think that's like the next, uh, Kyle and I were talking about the uh, the next kind of like pop or something is this, this true commodity with water. Like the price of water is just going to go through the roof. I was just reading that California, at least on the Western, the Western states, because we're all in desert, desert, that we're in a drought. And uh, now there's going to be new rules and regulations and restrictions on water use because not enough homeowners or people have volunteered, voluntarily decided to conserve uh, water. See, I don't know if you've noticed on the billboards and the Department of Water and Power are giving out grants, like, or what is it, rebates, $10,000, $15,000 rebates for water conservation efforts. Keith Johnson, Happy New Year. He says, it's good to see you. Thank you very much. It's good to be seen. Absolutely. It's good to be seen. <laughs> Oh, what else? So that's what's happening in, in California. Just kind of noticing just a lot of different movements happening in the business and market still on fire. A lot of things happening, which is why we brought back the show. This is why I took a dark, uh, went dark, took a break, come, came back. Uh, in addition to I'm in school as well. So a lot is happening. <laughs> a lot is happening. Keith Johnson. You know what, Keith? I want to say thank you, by the way, because you do send over some newsletters. Keith Johnson is a title rep and you would be some value for today's show. We're going to be talking about real estate crimes as we continue our real estate crimes series. OK, so, yes, we are continuing that series. And we are now on episode 144. I shared with you all, I talked to my marketing consultant, my son, my marketing advisor, and we were talking about this. We were saying, I said, son, should I continue with seasons and be on season eight and episode two, or should I just start just numbering off these episodes? And he was like, mom, you should just number them off. So that would be pretty cool that at some point Lathan takes over the show. 
I'm rooting for that, that the kids will take over Ready Set Real Estate. We'll have a new show. I get to retire at some point. It, I guess because I'm in the Keys, I'm thinking retirement already. I'm like halfway there. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm halfway to retirement. <laughs> so, okay. Great. Keith, Keith agrees. He says, yes, he can help. So Keith, stand by as I get ready to prepare. I'm going to share slides. So we're going to do classroom style. And I apologize. Last week, we were talking about selling swamp lands. And I forgot to share the slide. Or did I share this? Did I share the slide? I did. It. Oh, I did share the slide. I did have slides. Good. I think it was the show before that. We talked about Charles Ponzi. And there was giveaways. There was a giveaway. This week, today, we're going to be talking about selling the Brooklyn Bridge. So let's continue our series of selling the Brooklyn Bridge. And the reason why we are talking about real estate crimes is because, as I've seen with, oh, we kicked off with PP, PPE loan fraud, right? And we talked about how some uh, real estate professionals were committing uh, real estate crimes. And it's kind of sad to say, you would think, I mean, with all the thousands and infinite amount of, of income you can earn in this business, that there's no need. There's no need. There's just so much money. There's so It's so abundant. There's no reason to commit crimes. But to each his own, everybody has their own motive. They probably want more Gucci. They want more luxury condos. They want to drive the Maseratis and the Lamborghinis and all the toys that comes with it. They want fancy sensor toilets that you don't need to. I was watching a video and it said like, show me that you're a millionaire without telling me. And so I'm watching all these people show off their money. And it's so funny because it's those things that get some people thinking, you know, I might have to hit a lick real quick. <laughs> And that's unfortunate. So I shouldn't be laughing, but it's kind of sad and it's kind of funny because I know I'm an ethical person. And those aren't things in my gene pool to, to defraud people. Hence the reason I'm super agent. This is what I do. All right. So we're going to talk about George C. Parker selling the Brooklyn Bridge. You know what's so funny? When I recap these stories and we learn about these real estate scandals, if you weren't familiar that these sayings like sell, I can sell you some swampland, that story we talked about last week uh, came from Florida. That was from Charles Ponzi, the Ponzi scheme, right? That was a real thing. That wasn't like this shit, this expression. And then, oh, speaking of swampland. Okay, so hold on. Time out. Before we jump into this, I want to just share a quick video. Hold on. Hold on, because I think it's perfect. As we talk about, I'm going to share a, a clip of Kyle and I as we are on our trip here. And we are in San Pedro Keys. So I'm going to. So here we are. We are like rolling in our brand spanking new golf cart. And we are rolling down the main highway road. And here's what's really interesting where it's developed, and you, you can see this happening. This road is beautiful. I mean, compared to the roads in town, and that's not on the mainland where people are not frequenting, this road is awesome. Uh, you see even Remax is here, right? You've got all these companies here, which is why I'm here as well, is because, oh, I just want to make sure. Can you hear me? I want to make sure you can hear me. Just drop a comment, say yes, you can hear me, because I muted the video sound. Um, just want to make sure. So yes, say yes, I can hear you, Lisa. But look at this development. We're here on the island and look at this. This is actively happening. And I just wanted to share those uh, quick videos and clips of some of the modern developments that are happening. You see different styles. You see a lot of the contemporary builds, some modern builds. You see cabana style. What was interesting, I like these two. It kind of reminds me of being near... Uh, Torrance Beach, Redondo Beach, all there where it's all stacked up on one of each other. Uh, but here there's still lots of land being uh, available for sale, which excites me, right? Because we are on the cusp of something new and 
growing and developing. And you see a lot of this green, uh, just greenery. I love it. I think this is where we pass on the truck stop. I think it's an infamous place called truck stop. It had all these uh, food stops. It's like a whole bunch of vendors instead of how you see all the for sale, like tons of for sale, for sale everywhere. Great. Thanks, Keith. He says, yes, I can hear you. And look at that. You're, you'd be like alongside the riverbank. But last week, if you caught last week's show, you would have heard me say something very important as we talk about investing in land, which is why we talked about it last week is because what better way to honor this trip and also talk about when you're purchasing land, what your buyer due diligence should be. And I learned something interesting is that there are government easements depending where you are and they they own about 60 feet of the land from the riverbank. So, oh, there's truck stop. So that was a pretty cool spot, had great food. Uh, Hubby and I will go ahead and have, see, hey, that's me again. Hey, hi, Kyle. Look, look at Kyle. He's rolling, boy. Look at him. <laughs> and we're having a good time. All right. So that was just our little trip. And wanted to share that with you because it's so important. It's so funny when I do this, when I consult with people and we talk about real estate, oftentimes people are thinking real estate to just be houses, but real estate is everywhere. As you can see, it's everywhere. So it's interesting as I was talking about these easements, right? So the government's like, great, we're selling you acres of land or, or maybe an owner individually selling you acres of land. However, they are not telling you, you can't develop at least 60 feet of that land. 60 feet? That's a lot. Holy smokes. That is a lot. So be mindful of those things. And this is why we're continuing our real estate crime series is because we want to talk about what should you be looking out for? So let's talk about selling the Brooklyn Bridge. Could you imagine that someone had the audacity Gosh, just he would have made an excellent real estate agent. I mean, if he could sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. And in fact, George C. Parker sold the Brooklyn Bridge two times per week for 30 years. Two times per week for 30 years. Who knew that? Who knew the story of selling the Brooklyn Bridge? I did not, which is why. And I'm a glutton for learning. I'm a glutton for learning. This is why I wanted to do this series because all these expressions that I've heard, I was like, oh, that was a real thing, right? Selling the Brooklyn Bridge. Before George C. Parker sold the Brooklyn Bridge two times per week for 30 years, he was not the first person to do it. And what baffles me is that someone even had the audacity to think about selling it. Go figure. They had, they had the audacity. And William McClundy, McClundy, I would say McClundy, McClundy, uh, forgive me, McClundy family for chopping up your last name, but William McClundy was the first to sell the Brooklyn Bridge in 1901. And it just doesn't stop there. George C. Parker had sold it for an unspecified, unspecified amount of times. But what we know on record was at least so two times per week for 30 years. Could you imagine if I sold the same house over and over? <laughs> over and over. Keith says, Lisa, whatever you need, call me. I need to go. I'm so proud of you. Listen, Keith, no worries. We'll check back in. It was just a title, just title stuff, but I got it. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. We'll be in touch soon. So it's always nice to have some real estate professionals on because uh, they can chime in and say, yes, what you're saying is true. But oftentimes you all know that I, I kind of don't need, I don't need that. <laughs> I do a lot of my due diligence and research and then I'm here. I share it with you. That is my job is to empower you, inform you and educate you so that you have the information. So listen, he ended up selling. So you may say to me, like, how in the heck did he sell the Brooklyn Bridge two times per week. Not only did he sell the Brooklyn Bridge, he sold the Statue of Liberty. Ha ha ha! You thought it stopped there. No, no. He also sold Madison Square Garden. 
along with the Statue of Liberty and the Brooklyn Bridge and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Listen, Homeboy was selling all the big places in New York. This was the guy, the go-to guy in New York. It's so funny when I think about George C. Parker, wasn't that the name of the person who came up with Monopoly? Not came up. And I did. I do a wonderful class called The Real Life Game of Monopoly. I think I might do that session live here. Probably we'll do it in February, March. If you don't know the history of uh, Monopoly, it's a great segment. I think I have it archived on the YouTube already. And it's a special presentation that I've done in the past for various groups. And it's so much fun because a lot of people don't know the history of the pieces of the Monopoly game in the game. Like they all have meaning. And in reality, it's a game about the rich versus the poor. Go figure. What is real estate about? It's see, and that's where I think a lot of people get confused about this thing with real estate. This is not, yes, we do have some verbiage in our constitution about life, liberty, and right to property. But see, if you are not, I would say, and see what popped in my head just now as I was thinking about this statement, if you are not investing your money or finding ways to accumulate and leverage other people's money, hashtag OPM, then playing the real estate game is going to be a very challenging thing, especially as we see historically that there are some people that are counted out, counted out. Uh, that reminds me of a documentary that I had been working on. And I put it on a pause for a while because there's so many other projects that I wanted to pursue. But there's this documentary and concept that I was uh, that I was putting together called Counted Out. And it was it's really the story of the real estate industry uh, reflecting and really the story of the people of color in the real estate in, in industry, just kind of how uh, the opportunities have changed in Southern California over the years. And my title reps could uh, share a lot about seeing how the face of the real estate professional had changed and how that change uh, has detrimentally, I think, impacted uh, our communities in terms of ownership. So another conversation, another day, but I'm saying that in light of investing. And right now, as I see so much new money coming out of cryptocurrency and the crypto trading, a lot of new money. And those are services that my brokerage uh, certainly participates in is the buying and selling of real estate using cryptocurrency and working with companies that handles the contracts associated with that. So that's a whole nother topic and segment. We'll talk more about that as I continue to uh, strengthen my skills in that, especially as it's something new and more and more states are adopting it. California is learning how to adopt the smart contracts. Again, this is why I mentioned for uh, Keith, who's a title rep, uh, may be able to possibly speak on that. But we'll, we'll leave that for another segment. So today we want to talk about big dreams. And because for someone to be swindled, right, and scammed and, and defrauded out of their money, these people who were vulnerable immigrants that George C. Parker was selling the Statue of Liberty, the Museum of Art, the Madison Square Garden. I mean, you've got to have some big dreams, okay? Who has big dreams? I do. I have big dreams. I have great, big, huge visions. I'm a visionary and I execute. I certainly execute. And with that comes this thing called vulnerability. It's like moving forward in life and you move almost like scared straight, right? I've seen so many people post comments uh, as 2021 was wrapping up. How many people stepped outside of themselves? And despite the fear 
their dreams and their visions of wanting to do differently, wanting to achieve differently, they pursue that above the fear, which is where your dreams live, right? We've heard that. It's so cliche. It's on the other side. But when you're attempting to do something like that, how do you mitigate loss, right? How do you manage not being swindled, scammed, lied to? So as we talk about big dreams in real estate, especially being told that you could purchase the Brooklyn Bridge, hello, that's one hell of a big dream. How do you mitigate? How do you not get fooled and scammed out of your money? Jeez, especially when you think about immigrants who are coming here and wherever you are, because let's say you're coming to a place like Belize, Central America, and you want a piece of paradise. There's no real estate licensing required here. Oftentimes, owners are transacting their own sales. They're telling you, here's the price. You send the money. We'll sign the paperwork. Whoa. Now, me as a real estate professional, I'm a little bit on edge with transacting that way, especially because I need to know what I'm purchasing. So getting a survey, very important. Land survey, drop that in the comments below. Hashtag land survey. Okay, land survey, get a land survey. Um, some people may say, but uh, it's too expensive. You know what's also expensive? Losing your money to a bad investment. That's what's also expensive. You may say to me, Lisa, I don't know what the heck a land survey is. Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take a pause there. Think about this. Let you let you catch up here. Survey. By the way, you can go ahead and screenshot here because these are great tips on your buyer due diligence. If you got big dreams in purchasing and investing and albeit something massive like the Statue of Liberty, what should you be looking out for? <laughs> Well, let's first find out, does the person selling have the authority to sell? Hello? Is it theirs to sell in the first place? How do we know? How do we know? How do we know if the person who is selling you a piece of paradise has the authority to sell it? Well, there's this thing called chain of title. There's this thing called the records slash lands department, wherever you are in the world, there is a land department. In the United States, we call that the recorders or the registrar's office. Outside of the United States, now that I have such a global perspective, so wonderful. I'm telling you, travel is such a game changer when it comes to real estate. It really does. It's because you get to see and learn how other countries transact. Uh, I've also been studying what requirements are needed in terms of investing and purchasing and just kind of who the game players are. I always want to know who the players are when I am dealing in business, right? And that's just how I, how I deal. Other people, they go for it, right? And, and, then, and then they learn after the fact, like, oh, I didn't know, you know? And you ever wonder, see, this, this thing crosses my mind when someone sells a piece of land that they've been holding on for a very long time. The first question I ask is, why did they not develop it? Why are you holding a piece of land for the last 20, 30 years? Legitimate question. Those were questions that my land investor clients had. We first question, oh, you have, oh, you bought it eight years ago? Okay. So why didn't you develop it? Oh, because there's a federal patent on the land. That, allow, that says you can't build on 40, 25 feet to 40 feet of the land. There goes your massive house. There goes your development project. Can't do anything with it. That's why. And it's not to dissuade you from investing in land. That's not what I'm here to do. What are we talking about? Due diligence, right? Which is why you do land surveys. Because then the next question and issue that I oftentimes hear is, hey, the neighbor's putting a fence on my lot. 
Or I notice the neighbor's lot or fence is like really next to my window or it's on my driveway. See, all these things are important to ask yourself, where does my land end and begin? Because fence wars is a real thing. I've noticed I've had to, uh, I've had to reach out to real estate attorneys a few times last year, actually in the last three years, especially with areas being gentrified. The more gentrification uh, happening or occurring, I noticed there fence wars are becoming more of an increasing issue. Naturally so, right? You've been there 20, 30 years. There's a new uh, person and specifically someone who may not be of the same background, culture, ethnicity, and uh, they live, they build, they do things differently. They may want a little bit more security than what the neighborhood provides, and now they're building a fence. And then in order to build this fence, they've got to build six inches into your driveway, et cetera, et cetera, or their car can't fit in the driveway once they build the fence, so they have to come into four inches into your lot, or their door won't open, or their rear view mirror, you know, can't fit. I mean, I've heard all kinds of things. Uh, my trash bin, you know, sits there. I won't be able to put it in now because you put your fence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why oftentimes those cash deal transactions where it's like seven to 10 day escrows are usually not the best scenarios unless you're experienced and you front loaded your deals. Oftentimes my clients who are experienced have done all that. They front loaded their work and they are very clear as to what they're buying. What is concerning though, is that oftentimes to those who are experienced and they are investors, they don't care to front load their deal. Why? Why? Why would an investor care so much to front load their deal if they're investing to flip that property? For the obvious reason, they're not going to keep the property. They're going to sell it to an owner occupant buyer who now has to deal with the consequences of whatever issues, easements, conditions, restrictions go or run with the land. One that tends to be pretty popular right now is a hero and pace lane. I've been speaking about this for a couple years, and this is now starting to show up more and more. And so for those of you who are, are my real estate colleagues, make sure you are doing your due diligence in front loading your listings and find out whether those properties are subject to hero and or pace lanes. Those are liens that run with the land and are called hybrid loans that are loans slash liens slash special assessments that are repaid through the property taxes. I won't go through too much into that because I've spoken a lot about it, but again, you can do your research. And if you do need some assistance, I suggest you uh, call a real estate attorney, a title company, and or your broker of record. <laughs> That's my disclaimer, right? Call your professional team. Uh, don't call Lisa. Unless you're my client, of course, then of course we work through that together. So those can be problematic. So when you're purchasing and investing, again, big dreams, title insurance is paramount. Buy title insurance. And that's something that's available wherever you are. And so this is why I mentioned it would be great to have my title rep colleagues, or those of you who would chime in uh, after the live, go ahead and hashtag replay so we know we're catching you after the live, and would love for you to chime in about the importance of title insurance. Now, I'm not a title rep, but title insurance protects the chain of title from claims of ownership prior to your to taking it over. So it's not that you purchase the property and the insurance covers you for everything af that happens after you purchase. No, it's the reverse. And it's tricky in theory. So in fact, it actually protects you against any claims for anything that would have happened or transpired or would have been recorded that was not caught 
during the preliminary title check or when they were reviewing the chain of title or the history of chain of title, for instance, they may not have seen a recorded document or there was something unrecorded, it will help with any claims that would arise after the sale, okay? And that's really in, that's really important to, to, to get. What's also key to know is that title insurance will also assist, assist with claims on fence wars, right? And so they will assist with paying for the land survey. Land surveys can run around, uh, last I checked, we were at it like $1,800, so $1,800 for a land survey. Very different from the appraiser. Appraisers do valuation and they do three types of valuations, sales comp comparisons, right? So, so the sale comparable approach, meaning this property is valued at X dollars based on what is being sold. They do a cost comparison approach, meaning how much to rebuild this property. How much is this property worth if we do a cost approach? The third is the income approach, oftentimes used for rental property, and they will do rent surveys, meaning it's an appraisal based on the rents. How much is the market current market rent in the area? How much can you get this unit for or each unit for? And then they annualize the rents and factor that in. And it's, a, it's all a formula. They factor, back, factor it back into the property and they come up with the valuation. Now, what's key is most people don't read appraisals, but I, again, me, right? Blame me, Lisa reads. <laughs> hey, Alton, Alton says, this is good. Well, please make sure you share the wealth. Make sure you press one, lets me know you're here. Press two, lets me know you shared it. Glad to see you on. And the sales comparison, cost and income approaches vary and having a skilled lender and underwriter will know what to order, what approach to request. Because guess what I've noticed in these last couple of months? And you've got to be active in this business to see that this was that this has been happening. Because of the overbidding of properties, a lot of the properties have not been appraising based on what? based on what? Sales comps approach. Why? Because they are move, they were moving so quickly. So appraisals were looking back at three months to six months to a year, depending, you know, how many transactions within a time frame. And what's interesting is that a couple of my transactions, I saw the under underwriters were requesting to um, evaluate, evaluate the property based on a cost approach. One of my recent transactions, the appraised value came in over our contract price, not based on sales comparison approach, but based on cost approach, meaning how much would it cost to build this property back, right? Using today's materials, et cetera. And so that's how our appraisal uh, uh, got through and we, and, and the, now the loan goes through. I'm giving you all extra information because that's what's on my mind right now as we talk about land surveys and how that differs from appraisals. I don't want you to confuse those things because even when we talk about appraisals, appraisals different, differ for a VA appraisal, a conventional appraisal, and an FHA appraisal. I can do a whole class on that, not today. All right, so let's continue with the chain of title and preliminary report as we talk about big dreams. Selling the Brooklyn Bridge. Do, do you own the Brooklyn Bridge? <laughs> Show me the paper. I need the receipts. Show me the paperwork, right? And so here's here's to not to to the you know, not that the people who were being swindled weren't asking for the paperwork because guess what? Mr. Parker was coming up with documents that appear to be legal 
and he was forgery. Uh, he was committing forgery with these grant deeds. And so you may say like, but wait, I have the paperwork. This is legit. It says, here's the address and here's the owner and here's the amount and the date of transfer. And it was signed. This is legit. So that's the challenge with legitimizing some of those documents, which is why I said, you've got to check with the lands department. I don't care where you are in the world. There is a place such as a lands department and it is on your onus, meaning it is on you to do your due diligence to find out and see for yourself. And that's if you're not using a reputable real estate broker or settlement attorney. Those are title attorneys or escrow companies that actually handle those documents for you. So if you are not using those pro professionals, then I suggest you go down to the land department yourself and you verify the chain of title. All right. Second, grant deeds are witnessed by notaries. Notary publics, they call them justice of the peace here in Belize is what I've learned over the years. And you've got to be very careful because depending where you are in the country, this, the translation of notary is also means attorney. So be careful as well when you're transacting with uh, those types of documents and where you are, because that document is to be notarized. It is witnessed usually by second or third party and oftentimes done by notary who will authenticate your signature by means of identifying you are the person whose name is in the document. You are the person who's identified by way of your ID. I'm a notary public. That was my first uh, foot into real estate, actually. Can't, you cannot close a deal without a notary. Nope, couldn't get past. Couldn't close a deal without a notary. You still can't. Still can't close a deal without a notary public. And in fact, because fraud is so prevalent in the real estate business, that notaries have to be on a, an approved list. Yep. I actually, and you, some of you may know this story, and I haven't given you the full story because we're still in it and to protect the identities and keep it confidential. I actually have a case that involves Forge um, and an attempt to disinherit my client out of her mother's property. And so that is actually in civil court as we speak. And there's a lot to be learned from that particular transaction because unfortunately it involved a real estate professional. It involved a notary public and it involved other parties like a knowingly experienced investor that was willing to go through with that transaction. And they uh, defrauded and disinherited, disinherited my client out of her interest, 50% interest. So that's a real thing. So some things to look out for when you're dealing with notaries is check to see if the notary seal is current. Hello, check the dates because my notary seal has an expiration date on it. And in fact, we have serial numbers that are registered and can be tracked. So especially when you're dealing with these types of professionals, they can be tracked, everything we do. If you're a licensed professional, you're registered with the state, you represent the states, right? You have an obligation to protect the people you are doing business with. All right. And then I mentioned check with a real estate broker, settlement attorney regarding the parcel and the property specs. Because I have seen it on occasion where the wrong loan was recorded on the wrong property. It's important to do something as simple as check the property address. Check the lot number, check the parcel number, double check, triple check, quadruple check. Doesn't hurt to check. Doesn't hurt to make sure that people are putting in the correct information. And then, of course, the last one is what I've been talking about this whole time is purchase title insurance. In fact, some places won't want to do a deal with 
without title insurance. And that ensures the deed. And you can usually tell if your deed is insured because it has a recorded ID number. There's a transaction document number attached to it that's associated with the title insurance policy. When I run title checks and I pull documents, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a title insurance company name and a title insurance contract number, oftentimes associated with an escrow number or a title policy number, a settlement number. You get it, right? There's a number associated with the recording of that document. Now, when you don't see a number or a title company associated, that means you have is what you have what is called an uninsured deed. An uninsured deed oftentimes is what usually I was going to say prevalent again, but I don't want to use that term is common associated with documents that can be forged meaning the person who signed it, who had the authority to sell the property, did in fact not sign to transfer their property to the next person. So you may see a document saying that uh, person A has the authority, uh, is you know sole and separate property transferring to such and such. And you've got to look at all the verbiage the way it's transferred. Is it a bona fide gift? Is the proper verbiage associated with it? Or is this person married and it says that they sold it to you or they're selling it to you, but it says they're married and their spouse has not signed? Hello? Their spouse has to also authorize the sale of that property as well, which is why oftentimes you'll see that it will go as an uninsured deed because the other spouse did not sign. I won't get into all of that because there's just so many different scenarios. All in all, in short, make sure you're double checking, triple checking the people that you're dealing with. Do they have the authority to sell? Did you do a chain of title? Are the proper documents, seals, stamps, transfers associated with it and the proper fees being paid? And who's paying the fees, right? Recording fees and transfer fees. And are the proper entities receiving payment of those transfer fees? Because recording documents does cost money. Not so much. It's usually a percentage of the purchase price. And it varies per district, per county, per city, per state, per country. It varies. So make sure you're dotting all your I's, crossing your T's, making sure you have sufficient money to close that deal. All right. With that, I say have a fantastic, powerful, and productive week. I trust that you found this information valuable. It was so fun, as usual, to chime in, touch base with you. And remember, if you have any topic suggestions, you have new guests that you'd like to see on the show, make sure you tag and share and let them know. We are lining up our guests for 2022. I've got some great people that are come on and teach some classes and hang out with us and share some much more information, a lot more information on real estate with us. Remember, we talk about the flips, flops, booms and busts in real estate, all aspects of it, the raw and the uncut, because that's how I like it. Right. So I like to keep it real and giveaways, by the way. Was that all? No, I think that was Alton that was on. He did get a giveaway, did free giveaways last week. He got a Ready Set Real Estate Cup. So shout out to him. For freebies, I'm always giving stuff away. If you want the homeowner's guide to success, please send me an email to lisa at lasuperagent.com. Lisa at lasuperagent.com so that you can get your free homeowner's guide to success. It's got a great budget sheet how to uh, stay on top of things and helps you learn the difference between mortgage lender versus mortgage servicer, all the things that you need to know, especially now starting this month, notice of defaults, 
and those notice of trustee sales for those who are in foreclosure or facing foreclosure due to the pandemic and having lost their jobs and having lost their resources to continue paying on their mortgage payments uh, are now going to start facing those notice of defaults as those start to begin underway. Uh, Wells Fargo announced that they will be pr process processing or beginning their foreclosures uh, starting the end of January. So for those of you who have mortgages and you're in default with Wells Fargo, you have a little bit of time and it's not much time. It's 180 days. That's what you have. It's 180 days to figure out loan modification, a forbearance plan, which is what has expired for most people, a deed in lieu of foreclosure. That's mean essentially you're giving the house back to the bank or connect with a real estate professional to assist you with selling, at least cashing out some of that equity and either downsizing your life, going to rent for a couple years and getting back into the real estate game. Do know that if you have a foreclosure recorded on you, meaning if you lose your home by way of a foreclosure and once three years have passed, you are considered a first time home buyer. Why? Because you by HUD definition have not written the mortgage interest deduction on your taxes in the last three years. So very important to know this, even if you're a couple, you're a married couple, and you have not claimed the mortgage interest deduction in the last three years, even though you own a home, but you have not claimed it on your taxes, by HUD guidelines, you are a first time home buyer, which means you should call Lisa if you're looking to invest into another property and you are considered a first time home buyer. So listen, life happens in short. All I'm saying is, because I've helped people who've gone through it, this is not the end of it, okay? If you are experiencing something challenging, and uh, as we all have, we've all been there, I'm encouraging you to stick with it. Just make sure that you stay connected with someone who is experienced and knowledgeable on how to set you back onto that path of homeownership if you lose your property in a foreclosure, same goes for short sales. I've seen a couple short sales come through, not too many. And it's uh, a lot of the short sales that I am seeing on record is because of the hero and the slash pace liens. So those are easily, I think they're like about 90,000 in liens because most people don't know they end up costing that much. You, you're, you think you're getting a fancy window and a roof and a paint job and an HVAC system, and it's costing about 125,000, amortized over 20 years, and then add that to your first mortgage. But actually, if you get the hero pace lien, that now has first uh, position, first lien position over your mortgage, which means your lender is pretty pissed off that you did that. And they could call the lien due, but they're not gonna do that because that means mass foreclosure, get it? It's a whole big mess. That whole thing's a big mess. So anyway, with that, I say, have a powerful and productive week. Uh, stay connected. We'll see you next week on an informational packed episode on Ready, Set, Real Estate. Bye.